Jesus said that when we pray, we should pray, Father, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Everyone needs forgiveness, which means everyone also needs to forgive. But forgiveness is never an easy subject. And regardless of whether you need someone to forgive you or you need to forgive someone, the reason forgiveness is needed is because hurt, pain of some kind is involved. And nobody likes to talk about or deal with hurt and pain. So much that often our story surrounding forgiveness is either ignored completely or it's held very close in a way that we cannot let go of the pain and find healing for the hurt. I've been a pastor for more than 20 years and I can tell you that during that time I have walked with people through some very painfully difficult forgiveness stories. But even so, I have also found that most people want to forgive. I've not met many people who want to be unforgiving people. Now, I'm sure they're out there and I might even know one or two of them, but in most cases, people know that to not forgive in the end only hurts themselves. They know that holding on to hurt only fuels the pain. They know that carrying grudges leads to bitterness and they do not want to become a bitter person. Most people want to forgive. The problem is that oftentimes they just don't know how. How do you forgive someone who's not sorry for what they've done? How do you get over the memory of what happened to you? Is it wrong to want justice or for the offender to even be forced to make things right if necessary? And those are real questions that do not always have easy answers. And then you add to that Jesus' teaching, then when we pray, we should ask God to forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. That somehow the forgiveness God has shown towards our offenses should motivate us to extend forgiveness to our offenders. Now, we, we know that is right, but it can sometimes feel overwhelming and impossible to fulfill. You know, thankfully, the Bible is filled with real stories that can teach us how others handled these kinds of questions. One of the most famous forgiveness stories in the Bible is found in the book of Genesis. It's the story of two brothers that were not on the same page when it came to the blessing of their father's inheritance. It's the story of Jacob and Esau. Now what's interesting is that most of us know this story, but not as a forgiveness story. We know it as a story of selfishness and family drama and betrayal, and it certainly is that. But it's also more than that. Esau is the brother that was strong, tough, hairy skin, hunter type that loved the outdoors, while Jacob was not an outdoorsman at all. He was quite smaller, physically weaker, smooth skin. He was an indoorsman that preferred cooking to hunting. And one day Esau comes in from hunting and he's starved and exhausted and asks his brother for something to eat. And Jacob agrees on one condition that in exchange for a meal, Esau would give him the eldest son's birthright. See, in ancient cultures, they often recognized the eldest son by granting him privilege, which usually involved inheritance rights that was special over the younger sons. We know in the Mosaic Law, for example, the eldest son received a double portion of the father's inheritance. And that is the price that Jacob demands for one meal from his brother Esau. Now, obviously, this is an effort to exploit the moment and take advantage of his brother's situation. Now, I've been hungry before, but I don't think I've ever been that hungry. But apparently Esau was, and he agrees. And he purchases one meal from his brother Jacob for the cost of his birthright. And it tells us in Genesis that after that happened, Esau despised his birthright. That day, a grudge was born. Now, years later, as their father Isaac was about to die, Jacob deceives his brother one more time. He dresses up like Esau and he goes in and deceives their father out of Esau's blessing. The only thing Isaac had left to give Esau was also taken by Jacob. He had already swindled his brother out of his birthright and now he took the blessing from Esau. And for the second time, Jacob takes something from his brother. And as a result, here's how the Bible says Esau felt about his brother Jacob. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And he said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near, then I will kill my brother Jacob. And in fear for his life, Jacob leaves and he goes to live with his uncle Laban. Now, I think most of us could identify with how Esau felt. 
We might not literally seek to kill someone, at least I hope not, but I think we all would feel anger and outrage if this were happening to us, and rightly so. To have someone we trust lie about us and steal from us and betray us, this is a deep kind of wound unlike any other. And that is the story most of us know about Jacob and Esau. A story of lies and betrayal, but that is not where the story ends. In fact, often the part of the story that we skip is actually the most important part of the story. It's been 20 years since Jacob and Esau have seen each other. During that time, Jacob has grown up, he's matured, but he's also afraid to meet his brother. And when Esau comes his way and as Jacob prepares to meet his brother for the first time in 20 years, he does so in the most humble of ways. The Bible tells us in Genesis 33 that as Jacob approaches Esau, he bows himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. And what happens next is something no one expected, least of all, Jacob. It says that Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him and threw his arms around his neck and kissed him and they wept. 20 years earlier, if they had met, there would have been justice, revenge, and someone was likely going to die. 20 years later, when they do meet, there's an embrace, there is a kiss, there is crying. What moved Esau from his grudge to forgiveness? What will lead us to show that kind of forgiveness? I think it begins by realizing that we are not an innocent party. Yes, Jacob demanded a birthright for a bowl of soup, and Esau agreed, but he agreed in haste, and he gave up his birthright. He could have made his own meal, but instead Esau chose to sell his birthright for an inheritance. For a bowl of soup. He showed no self-control. He showed no forethought. He was impatient. He was lazy. And he was selfish. How was Esau the selfish one? Because he sold his inheritance for one meal and not only deprived himself, but his future family. All future generations of Esau's family would be affected because of his impatience and selfishness about satisfying this one desire for one meal in this one moment. And that wasn't Jacob's fault, it was Esau's fault. But what about Jacob deceiving their father out of Esau's blessing? Well, that was totally Jacob. But to decide to kill Jacob over money, Esau was also at fault. There's no amount of money that is worth someone else's life. Esau was not an innocent party. The Apostle Paul says that we have all sinned and fallen short. Jesus said that before you remove the speck from your brother's eye, Take the big plank out of your own. You see, when we are hurt, when we are betrayed, or when we are wronged, the path to forgiveness always begins by remembering that you have hurt people too. I said earlier that everyone needs forgiveness, which means that everyone needs to forgive. We know this is true, but do we let this truth drive our willingness to forgive others? Now, to move towards forgiveness, you must also remember this that my unforgiveness is worse than how they offended me. Esau's response was, I will kill my brother. That is an extreme response, even given those circumstances. You know, as a Christian, unforgiveness is actually the most selfish and hypocritical of all sins that you can commit. The entire basis of Christianity is that we owe God such a debt that we could never repay it. Instead, Jesus, his son, paid that debt for us on the cross. Our forgiveness cost Jesus his life. So to withhold forgiveness from someone and the way they have hurt us when God has forgiven us, could there be a more selfish act we could commit? I'm not sure there is. Which is why for me personally, those times that I have struggled to find the desire within me to forgive someone, if I would just go back to the truth of how God has forgiven me, eventually I'm convinced that to refuse forgiveness is actually worse than how they have hurt and wronged me. Now forgiveness does not necessarily mean trusting again. Even Jesus said, be as gentle as a dove and as shrewd as a snake. Trust takes time. And when you've been hurt and wronged, it may take a long time to trust that person again. Forgiving them also does not guarantee reconciliation. The Apostle Paul wrote that if possible, so far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. 
Trust takes time to rebuild. Reconciliation might never be possible again because of them. But here's the thing. You do not have to trust someone or be reconciled to someone to forgive someone. Forgiveness is completely independent of trust and reconciliation. And the reason as Christians we choose forgiveness is because we recognize that we need to live for more than revenge. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, Though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. What is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. Esau had wasted a quarter of a lifetime hating his brother, waiting for the moment he could exact revenge. And we don't know the moment it happened, but one day Esau woke up and decided trying to get revenge was a waste of time because his inheritance was actually just wasting away. And the pain of what Jacob did all those years earlier was only momentary. So to live for revenge meant he was only living for what is wasting away. It was time to live for more. Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him and threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And they wept. Now it's hard to accept this truth when we are in the midst of hurt. But the fact is, this life is momentary. That includes all of our successes, all of our failures, and even all of the wrongs that we have experienced. They are temporary. But there is something that's eternal, the kingdom of heaven. And when we fix our eyes on that, we can find the encouragement we need to live for more than revenge. We can live for peace. We can live for love. The Bible says this in Galatians chapter 5. Brothers, you are called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. You see, as Christians, we are not to destroy one another. We are to serve one another. We're not to devour each other. We are to love each other. So the next time you're struggling with forgiveness, remember this. Forgiveness is understanding that what someone does to me matters far less than what God has done in me.